right, welcome back. Thank you for coming back after I'm glad the refreshments made it. So I'm gonna, we're gonna get started right away since it's a little, a little after three. So it's uh, my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Uh, David Montgomery is a MacArthur Fellow and Professor of Geomorphology here uh, in the Department of Earth and Space Sciences at the University of Washington. His research interests involve the effects of geological processes on ecological systems and human societies, and interactions among climate, tectonics, and erosion in shaping topography on Earth and Mars. He is a three-time winner of the Washington State Book Award for The Rocks Don't Lie, A Geologist Investigates Noah's Flood, Dirt, The Erosion of Civilizations, and King of Fish, The Thousand-Year Run of Salmon. So please welcome David Montgomery. Oh, well, thanks for the invitation to cross the street and come and give a talk without having to get on an airplane. It's really, <laughs> really nice to do. Um, well, I am a, I'm a geomorphologist, and what I want to do is, is, first of all, explain to you what that is, because when I got on MacArthur, the New York Times had absolutely no idea what that word meant. Um, but I want to then also give you a bit of an insight into the kind of work that I do, the nature of the research I do, kind of how I do it. Um, and leave some time, answer a few questions that the organizers have seeded into my, into my email account. Um, and then also be glad to entertain uh, questions from you guys uh, um, as, we, as we end. So what's a geomorphologist? Uh, and let me try an experiment. Can you hear me in the back without this thing? No, no yes. So the people in the front can't, but the people in the back can. OK, so I'll <laughs> use the mic for the people in the front. Um, uh, so, a geomorphologist is somebody who studies the surface forms of the Earth. A hundred years ago, I would have been called a physiographer or a topographer, and it's like geomorphology, it's like Earth form science, right, in terms of the etymology of it. So I study topography, what shapes it? And I'm not res restricted to Earth. We sort of extended the geo part to cover other planets. We don't call it aeromorphology for Mars. Um, but as you might imagine, with the kind of interest in landform evolution, and things, the erosional processes that shape topography, the Oso landslide has, has uh, uh, um, taken a bit of my attention over the last six months or so. And in fact, probably on Monday or Tuesday next week, the report of the, the GEAR committee that I'm on, the Geotechnical Extreme Events Response Committee, is going to come out where we actually spent time on the landslide. And what I want to do is take a couple minutes to walk you through what somebody like me sees in, in something like this and how we sort of go about the, uh, approaching the problem of trying to understand it. So it's sort of basic geomorphology. Um, and I don't, does anyone have a laser pointer or anything? Um, okay, I, I will gesticulate. Um, <laughs> the old fashioned way, shadows and hand puppets. But the, um, okay, so this is the Oso landslide. It's a shot from across the valley wall. I was able to get out there uh, a few weeks after it actually happened. Um, and you'll notice, A, as you can tell from media accounts, it was a very large landslide. It was obviously a very tragic landslide, had a, had a, a tragic human toll. Thank you very much. Um, and basically, the kind of things that you can look at, that, I mean, you obviously notice the big scar, you see the scale of it with the trees, it surged across the whole valley bottom. Um, some of the questions we're wrestling with in the gear report are, why did it go so far? Why did it go so fast? Why was it so big? Those are the kind of questions that a geomorphologist like myself when faced with a disaster like this, can get called in to try and help answer and address. And the first, say, week after the disaster, when the focus was obviously on trying to recover people who were, were injured or, or bodies for the people who were, were uh, fatally struck by it, you couldn't really get access to the site, and yet the media was incredibly interested in saying, well, what happened? So what kind of resources, as a scientist, do you have to investigate that? Well, you can go and take photographs from across the valley. You can go to the map library and get the geologic map out and go, okay, well, what was actually in this hill? Um, and, and you sort of rely on sort of secondhand media reports. Uh, it was a very interesting week. I'd be glad to answer questions about that at the end of this. But what can you tell from basically just looking at the site? Well, notice that there's this line running across there. It's a very fundamental. Uh, transition in the nature of the materials that form this hillside. A geologist would call it a contact. It's a boundary between one kind of stuff and another kind of stuff. And essentially the story of this, this uh, hill, what made it so dangerous is it was made out of very loose, very weak material um, that got very wet and that had been exposed on a very steep slope. I mean, in a nutshell, that's the story. And if, if that sounds like common sense, that's because an awful lot of geology is, which is why I like it a lot. Um, 
And so, well, what's the story here? Well, essentially, if you look at the nature of the materials, the stuff that's exposed at the bottom of the slope, this sort of grayish stuff, it's not in place, it's moved, but uh, that gray color is uh, very typical of glacial lacustrine deposits, lake sediments. The basic story is this whole stack of material here is material that was deposited when this river valley was dammed downstream by a wall of ice during the Pleistocene, the last glacial advance about 15,000 years ago in this region. It dammed the river and stuff coming in from the mountains upstream basically flowed into the lake that was then formed. It started to be deposited as lake sediments. It turns out it was mostly silt as opposed to clay. When you think of the stuff you find in a lake, you usually think of it as clay is settling out very slowly in a lake. This stuff turned out to be silt, which is actually one of the keys to why it went so far, I think. Um, but and then why was it filling with silt? Well, has anyone been out to, uh, say, Mount Rainier lately or a glacier system and looked at a river downstream of it? It's kind of a milky color usually, sort of this whitish color. That whitish stuff is glacial flour. It's powdered rock. It's silt. Basically, uh, clays, the very fine clays you might find, say, in your garden, typically happen when you weather rock minerals, when stuff changes one mineral into another. Silt forms when you basically pound up rocks beneath a glacier and you just get smaller pieces of the same stuff. Uh, so you essentially had this, these silty lake sediments being deposited, and then above that there's a bit of sand, and this gray stuff here is glacial till. That's the stuff that a glacier actually plasters onto terrain. Uh, beneath it, it's, a, it's when it dries, it's like concrete. It's got everything from clay to boulders within it. It's basically the dog's breakfast of pieces of Canada that ended up on the glacier, <laughs> got brought down to where we are when the ice melted, and then got plastered beneath the ice onto the terrain. Uh, and the stuff on top up here, it's basically sand and gravel. It's river sediments. And so um, that's the stuff that was uh, deposited by the meltwater coming out of the glacier as the glaciers were melting back. And so you basically have this stack of fairly loose stuff that once the glaciers left, the river cut back down into it. So it's kind of like if you went to the grocery store and you looked at that, the pile of oranges and if it was all sort of flat and you went and the, you just took the ones from the side and kept steeping it up, eventually you then pull the one out of the bottom, it's all going to come down. That's what the river's been doing to these valley walls since the glacier left. And the river cut down, has been bouncing back and forth across the valley wall. So that's basically the setup for the, the geological story. Now it turns out that when I went to the map library and got the geologic map of this slope, the story I just told you of what's in the slope wasn't what was shown in the geologic map. Why not? Well, look at this absolutely beautiful, I hate to say this with this, with this site, but this beautiful exposure of the sediments. Um, geologists love road cuts, and we, we have places that we can actually see into the terrain because it gives us insight into what's actually there. Imagine you were trying to map what was in this slope on this slope. You know, there's a certain problem that it's covered with trees, it's very hard to see stuff. You get little bits and pieces of insight about what's in the slope. When it gets all cleaned off, you actually see what's really there. And so one of the first things I learned when I went out to this site was that the geologic map was really good, but it wasn't quite what was actually in the slope. That happens to geologists all the time. That's why we do different generations and, and editions of the same map over and over again. That knowledge improves with time. But let me walk you through some of these deposits. So this is basically the top of the site. You'll notice that that's a tripod. That's about the scale of a human being right there. These orange things are survey targets to try and uh, keep track of whether or not this uh, was at, uh, had any risk of future failure. Uh, there's the sand and gravel up through here. This stuff in here is the glacial till. Uh, you can see that there's little bits of moisture. It's a little wetter along the till. Sand and gravel absorbs water readily. So think about what the water is doing falling onto the slope. It's getting onto here, it goes through the sand and gravel, it comes down to the stuff that is hard to actually percolate through, and it builds up, it gets saturated, it can flow sideways. That plays a role in actually destabling slopes like this. Um, if you look sort of farther down this slope, as you go uh, part way down, there's this broad bench, which if we go back to things, it's this slope in through here. This is actually kind of weird. When you basically get up and look at it, it's covered with the trees that have all fallen essentially backwards. And what that tells us is the slope accelerated out from under the trees. And so basically this whole block of the hillside basically came down intact. There's areas of the forest floor where there's rooted ferns still sitting there. Um, the soil's in place. The whole thing basically dropped down almost as an intact unit. 
Um, and we go to places like this and walk around all over this to piece that kind of information together. Um, and so if you go farther down to the slope, down to essentially, let's go back to, go down to look at this area, you notice a big contrast with the trees here and the trees here. These have all been knocked down and they're all laid, they're all laid back uniformly as if it all went in one direction at one high velocity. You go down and look at this block and what do you see? Near, farther uh, down near the bottom, there's trees that are still standing. Not many, right? Most of them are knocked over, but they're still standing. The other thing that you see is there's deciduous, uh, where's some of the deciduous trees? Um, there's some deciduous trees in this lower block too that were not in the upper block, which actually was a key for helping us decipher the sequence at which the site fell apart. Um, but you'll notice that down at the far end of the valley pile, there's this gray stuff. There's not much in the way of vegetation still on it, and there's not much topography. There's not much terrain. The front of this landslide basically liquefied and flowed out across the valley bottom. It, turned, it fluidized, it turned into a debris flow. And so you had, and that was the reason um, uh, that it was so deadly, is that the mechanics of that moving across the valley bottom basically swept the forest off the valley floor and the houses along with it to the far side of the valley. Um, this is a close up of that lower part of the debris field, again, just showing you that, yeah, some of these trees are actually going to survive having moved about a thousand feet down just rafting on this thing where the slope is literally flowing out away from under it. Um, if you go down to the very uh, bottom of the deposit on the far side of the valley, what you find are walls of, of trees and mud uh, in the area that basically was the valley bottom, all the material that got swept to the far side. Um, and so the question is sort of what happened at the site? How did it actually work? And one of the ways we go about doing that is walking all over it, looking for the relations of uh, what piece fell on what other piece, how did, how did all those trees fall in the different um, areas. The other things we can do are go to essentially the seismographic station and go, hey, did, was this thing big enough to actually cause little earthquakes? And it turns out it was. And Kate Altstadt, who is one of the um, grad students who's just finishing here at the seismographic station, within a day or two of the slide, basically looked and found that the, um, this, these two there were two seismic signals from the actual landslide. So we're looking at basically like a seismograph, the kind of thing that you normally would see in terms of vibrating the needle the way an earthquake does. Uh, this slide happened in two pieces. There was a first one that was bigger at 10.37 a.m. and then a second piece that failed a couple minutes later and then little slides that had continued off the scarp um, afterwards. And it turns out that when we went out into the field to look at the relations on this site, uh, we didn't really sort of have in mind, oh, there were two pieces. We just went out and said, okay, well, what happened? Well, it turns out we basically concluded that this first piece was the lower half of that slope was so wet that it liquefied in place and surged across the valley bottom. And then the top part that included that big bench where all the trees got laid back, that removed the, the support from the upper part, and that upper part just sort of fell into the hole and extended and slid. So you had really sort of two, two pieces. The first half is the one that did all the damage. And we were able to, one of the things that will come out in the report next week is essentially that area lower on the slope had been failing since the 1950s. Um, and I think I will show you, um, well, I'll show you a, a couple more pieces of data on the OSO slide. Um, this basically shows you the thickness of the deposit. So the, this red outline is the outline of the slide. So the first photo I showed you is from looking here up at the scarp. And the colors are key to the depth of the debris field. Um, some of the places where there had been uh, houses originally are buried under about 70 feet of debris. Um, the houses, though, ended up at the far end of the valley bottom. In other words, if you went looking for victims in the places where their houses had been, you wouldn't have a prayer of finding them. Because what you need to understand to actually do that kind of a rescue operation, or sadly a recovery operation, is what are the vectors of movement that would happen within a landslide. So if you know where something started, where would you, where would you look for it? Um, and that's where having models or, or previous published, published work works. Um, but essentially, uh, this lower part of the slide failed out first, and then this upper part dropped into the hole. Um, it turns out that there had been published work on this very site. It took the media a couple days to actually figure it out. And I'm embarrassed to say that I was actually the guest editor of the journal issue that published this paper, which I also reviewed. 
because uh, you know it's a guest editor, you can't find reviewers, so you do it yourself. Um, and it turns out that it was on the Hazel landslide, which was exactly the same hill slope that failed as the Oso landslide. It was the lower half of that hillside. Um, and it had first started failing in the 1950s, it failed again in 1967, failed again in, in the 1980s, and then again in 2006, as I'll show you in a minute. But one of the things that, um, uh, you know, basically once we figured out that this was actually a published paper, then everybody wanted to you know, like know well, what had been said about it before and so forth. Um, but what I'm embarrassed about is how rapidly we forget the stuff that we were involved in and forget the spatial arrangement of things. It would have been really cool if there was some kind of database you could go to and say, this spot on Google Earth, what are all the published papers that have ever sort of like, you know, been relevant to this place? This kind of work would have been found much faster. But, you know, we did uncover it. Dan Miller is one of our graduate students in Earth and Space Sciences a couple decades ago. He actually warned about the potential for catastrophic failure of the OSO's uh, side slide. Uh, based on the work that he did back in the 1990s uh, with, with John Cias. But basically, uh, this is a, the aerial photograph that's shown in 1965 that shows essentially what it looked like um, back in the 60s. Um, this is basically that first slide was, uh, that I showed you was looking this way. Um, 1970, this slide, 1984, it's all grown over again. 1991, it's grown over again. But basically what you can see is this, this hill slope had a history of moving. Why was this site so unstable? Well, look at what the river's doing. It's cutting into the toe of the slope. When a river goes around a bend, it basically, its erosional energy is concentrated on the outside. It's going to cut on the outside of a, of a curve. Same way that you know, sort of race car drivers sort of bank up. Centrifugal force helps with that. And you basically are going to erode at the toe of the slope. Um, and it happened over and over since the 1950s. The area was essentially known to be a landslide hazard. Uh, one of the other things we were able to dig up is that uh, Snohomish County published a landslide hazard map back in 2010 where if you look at the whole county and you look at the area where the Oso slide is, and then just I'll just zoom in on this for the next couple slides, but that little red dot and all these other big red dots are landslides that are recognized as uh, hazards in Snohomish County. The yellow areas are areas that are areas of steep slopes that may or may not be a hazard depending on what's on the site. Um, and they're based on essentially existing landslides. So one of the things to notice is there's an awful lot of fairly large red dots in here that make the Oso slide look pretty small. So if we zoom in on it, basically you zoom in on the Stilaguamish River Valley in through here and then on the site right through there and yeah it gets pixelated but basically there's the red, that's the old landslide shown on Miller's aerial photographs from the 1960s. You know, it was a recognized landslide hazard. But you'll also notice that across the river, which is the area where all the houses were, there's no hazard. This highlights a really fundamental problem with dealing with landslide hazard assessments. And that is the damn things don't stay put. They move. And if you're actually going to try and do a realistic assessment of landslide hazards, you need to know where they're going to start, how big they're going to be, and where they're going to end up. And in the Snohomish County assessment on this particular map, they got the sort of source area of it right, but the problem was is that the hazard was actually downslope across the river where the landslide ended up after it failed. And so there's this highlights sort of a problem that's not just a geological problem, but it's a problem in terms of how we convey information to the general public. What's the best way to actually get information on hazards into any homeowner's hands? And to actually be able to convey the kind of thinking that went into Dan Miller's report, where he basically warned that this slope, this little red dot, could fail catastrophically and end up over here someday. How do we get those out of the, the journal articles and into the hands of homeowners? And there, I think there's an obvious connection with, with you all in terms of how that kind of information may be served. There's another problem in how it's created, um, and I'd be glad to deal with questions like that too later, but one of the things that brings up is the value of really high resolution topographic data. What you may have heard of as LIDAR data, laser-based altimetry data. Uh, this map is a map that Ralph Halgerud at the USGS put together uh, in the aftermath of the OSO slide. The red area there is the, the, the 2014, the March 22nd, 2014 OSO slide. This red thing here is the head scarp of it, the hatching is the deposit. But what I'm really showing you this for is that look at the topography. 
The topography as portrayed on this is the U.S. Geological Survey 10 meter grid digital elevation models, which 20 years ago when I started at UW, I was thrilled to get data that had that much resolution. Why? Because it was so much better than anything we had at the time. You could actually see weird lumpy terrain, um, which wouldn't show up on the, the normal um, digital topography. Today, though, we've got access to a much higher resolution stuff. This is the same area as that last image showed with the LiDAR data uh, from Ralph's open file report. And you notice all the, the data, the, the spatial resolution you can see. And if you actually sort of clean off Ralph's mapping off of this, what he, what he did is he color-coded different generations of landslides, the youngest ones in red with A, the, the 2006 failure on the Oso site, uh, one across the valley bottom, all the way back to you know, his next oldest, his third oldest, his fourth oldest. How do you figure that out? Well, you look at what cuts what. The younger one cuts the older one, cuts the oldest ones. Um, and that's the common sense part of geomorphology again. It's, it's basically some cut something else, it happened afterwards. Um, but notice how clear the sort of blobs are, the scarp, the arcuate scarps. You don't have to be a trained geologist to basically look at this kind of topographic data and go, there were some really big, weird landforms there that look like landslides. Um, and this one in particular, right next door to the Oso slide, went all the way across the valley bottom and was about twice as big. It pops right out of the LIDAR data. Getting that into hazard assessments and in the hands of people who do the hazard assessments is critical for doing quality hazard assessments. Why? It tells the story. Now, I've managed to get some carbon dates out of the edge of this, this slide up here that's D that dates back to about 5,000 years. Um, so basically what we're looking at here, and that's in the oldest age class of Ralph. So you're looking at this map, it's sort of the history of 5,000 years worth of landslides. And if we go, okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, call it 15 and 5,000 years. If you, do, if you ask the basic question of how often on average do these things happen, you can do that calculation with this image by going, oh, 5,000 years divided by 15 is every 300 years. That's the same recurrence interval as the big, uh, as big earthquakes around here, maybe even a little more frequent than that. What that means is that we have this hazard that's hiding in plain sight that we're not incorporating into our land use planning, into our public discourse. We are doing a lot to plan for big earthquakes that happen, but the recurrence interval, the risk from these kind of landslides is comparable, although for a smaller region, to be fair. Uh, so what does that LiDAR data look like without the interpretive mapping on it? This is LiDAR data that we had from 2003. since. Since about 2003, actually, we've been serving the Puget Sound LiDAR Consortium data out of my lab across the street here on campus. That we just, we just bought a server dedicated to it, and every time that we get new laser altimetry data or local utilities or counties generated, if they'll share it with us, we'll post it on the web, then anybody can take it. Um, it's basic, our basic idea. And we've just been bootlegging it for yeah, uh, a long time now. Why? Well, we like this data. <laughs> we want this data. We use this data. And you never know what area you're going to actually use. So we just vacuum up as much as we can and make it as publicly available as we can. Why? Well, my students use it. And if not, well, my colleagues use it. And sure, my you know, people competing with us intellectually use it. But that's, you know, that's the whole point of science. It's not uh, is to make stuff happen. So basically, this is the site uh, in circa 2003. Uh, this is the development of Steelhead Lane. There's the Highway 530 that runs through there. And you'll notice the sort of red bit of a ragged tear right through there. That's the landslide scar of the historic landslide as it existed in 2003. This scar right through here is the old 5,000-year-old scar. Uh, this one is probably a little bit um, younger. That one next door is the other young one, which you know is you know, a lot younger than 5,000 years, we just don't know how much. I'm going to toggle this now to the same, LIDAR, same place, but LiDAR data from 2013. And what you'll notice is essentially changes right in here. So I keep your eye on that scarf and where the river is, uh, because basically in 2006, that scarf advanced a little bit and it pushed the river out. So we can go back and forth and you'll notice, okay, the, the scarf is sort of eating into this area up here, and the river is moving from about here uh, a few hundred feet to the south. Um, this thing had been failing repeatedly. Um, if you look at then what happened in 2014 with the LiDAR data, basically 
the rest of the hill went and it basically ran it all the way across the valley bottom. The terrain down here looks like it just sort of like the, the, the little sister version of the terrain right next door. That's the kind of information that a geomorphologist can look at and draw inferences about, oh, it was a big, fast, rapidly moving landslide that went across the whole valley bottom. That's the kind of stuff you know, I'm trained to think about. But in all honesty, you can train yourself pretty fast to see that here. <laughs> you know, it's the beauty of the LIDAR data, is that it tells its own story. Um, and if you stand back a little bit further, you can see essentially how Highway 530 got buried under as much as six meters of debris uh, in a matter of seconds. And you know, the size of this thing and the shape of it is sobering when you look at essentially the destructive power of the one right next door. Imagine what must have happened when that thing went. And, and these scarps down here just stand out in, in clear relief. So, you know, if you're thinking that this is basically an advertisement for the value of LiDAR data, you'd be absolutely right. Um, you know, we basically need, I think, to fly the whole country and make it available publicly to anybody who wants it and needs it because it's useful for all kinds of things, not just for planning. It's, it's, it's useful for hazard assessments. It's useful for infrastructure planning. It's useful for um, all kinds of things. Um, you can do things like take the difference between the different LiDAR, LiDAR data sets. The one on the left shows you the difference between 2013 and 2003. I've just taken the two data sets and subtracted the one from the other. And what do you see? Well, basically you see the net effect of the 2006 landslide. It caused erosion in the head and all the stuff piled up down at the bottom. You know, that's what landslides do. No big mystery there. Why this matters? is you notice that there's this big hole, basically, that developed right here on the edge of this old landslide. This is that 5,000-year-old landslide that I pulled a couple logs out of the edge of to get carbon dates on. And it's basically a place where the groundwater that's feeding this little creek in here is actually being sucked below ground by this big hole next door. And if you go out by the side of a creek and you dig a deep enough hole, the creek's going to flow through the gravel and sand and fill your hole up like a bathtub, right? That's what this landslide has been doing since the 50s. Every time it fails, it digs a little deeper, it gets a little bigger, and it's been capturing more water from next door. The springs that we mapped up on the edge of this as part of the gear report that will come out next week, basically at the time we mapped it, two and a half months after the landslide, was pumping about 35,000 gallons of water a day out of this area into the landslide. It's no, it's no mystery that the thing was really, really saturated. And then when we got record rainfall on top of it, that the whole hill slope basically liquefied and took off. It was basically capturing groundwater from next door. And you could argue about the potential role of forest practices or things like that as if you wanted to, as I'm sure people will in this case. But the basic value of doing this kind of, of comparison is that you know just you can look at the topographic change and went oh wait maybe there's an even bigger story at play in than, than that and the failure that happened uh, in 2014 basically caused even bigger changes up to 100 feet of drop up in the head but notice that the hole from that's that's taking groundwater from um, the neighboring uh, aptly named Headache Creek uh, <laughs> is is even bigger which means that the stuff that's sitting down here now isn't going to stay put it's going to be getting really, really wet over the next few decades. This thing, in my opinion, is not done um, with what all it may be doing. Uh, in terms of basically what I do, uh, you know, I'm an academic. I write a lot. Um, I like to go out and walk around uh, uh, landforms, but I'll publish in places like geology, hydrological processes. There's a whole list of things up there, uh, none of them particularly pertinent uh, here, but I also I've uh, just written a textbook, an introductory geomorphology textbook, working on one on sustainability. Um, and at present, I have sort of three graduate students. That's sort of the portfolio of what I do uh, in terms of, of writing and research. Um, in terms of the flavor of research, I'll give you a taste of sort of two things. Uh, the first is that I've been doing research in southeast Tibet now for about a decade on the gorge of the Tsangpo River. It's a very narrow, Gorge. Uh, it's at, at the corner of essentially what, what uh, used to be called Burma, I guess it's Myanmar now, uh, what used to be called Tibet, that's now I guess a part of China, um, and what um, used to be called uh, um, an independent tribal area that, that after World War II became part of India, much to the surprise of the residents. Um, it's a very remote corner of the world. Uh, this particular river is a rapidly eroding river on the planet. 
it's eroding at about a centimeter or two per year. Now, to a geologist, that's screamingly fast. Your fingernails probably grow faster than that, but to a geologist, that's a really fast rate of, of river incision. Um, and so I've been working on it for a while to try and figure out the explanations for that, but as so often happens in geologic fieldwork, when we went there and actually started studying this river, we real I realized that there was a much more interesting story in the stuff we had not thought to ask. Um, and that was, when we got to the valley of the Tsangpo River, sort of upslope of the gorge on the Tibetan Plateau, so we're up <coughs> about 10,000 feet here, 10,000 feet more to the top of the peaks around it. There's these big flat landforms, and remember I'm a geomorphologist, so this, my eye goes right at these things, and it's a delta, but it's sticking up several hundred feet into the air in this river valley. And if you, the Chinese have conveniently cut roads into it in places, and you can see there are lake sediments with a little bit of flu river gravel on top. And so there was a lake that sat in this valley bottom at some point, um, and if you basically drive up and down the valley and you make a plot of elevation versus distance and you plot on it where those lake sediments are, lo and behold, they are like, at, you know, they define an old lake level. They're kind of flat. You kind of go, yes, I was right. <laughs> um, and there's a lower one down here, an upper one down here, and it turns out there's also river terraces, a pair of them that come down and the first one ends at the first lake, the next one goes down and ends at the second lake. Um, so I got really excited that this had not been sort of recognized before and that this valley had been filled with all the lakes, but there was a problem. If you look from those kind of exposures and you look downstream and you trace that lake level all the way out, you basically hit air all the way out through the Himalaya. There's no dam. There's nothing to hold a lake in place. So why was there a lake there? If you go downstream far enough to the entrance of the gorge of the Tsangpo, this most rapidly eroding place on earth, um, and you basically look at where is the elevations of that higher lake, it basically is right at about the place where a, a moraine, a pile of glacial debris, stuff not unlike what the Oso site was made out of, a little different, but same kind of stuff, glacially uh, moved material, uh, from a glacier that came off the high peak in Amchabaro over here, it came down, it's truncated at about that lake level. Basically, this was the dam that was holding that lake in. And What's the last thing you would like to make a lake, a dam out of? Ice. A sponge would not be a good dam either, but ice would be even worse. Why? Well, it floats. You basically, you know, if, you, if, I, if a ton of ice came down here and dammed the a lake, a river valley, you're going to back water up behind it, you're going to create a lake. What happens when the water overtops the ice? Well, the ice floats. What happens to the lake then? Well, there's nothing holding it in. It goes all the way, it goes down to India in a screaming wall of water that was about 700 feet high. Um, this got us really excited. Uh, this just shows you the, um, you know, we're talking disasters, right? So, um, <laughs> yeah, th this shows you uh, the entrance to the gorge of the Tsangpo River. So it's basically, if you went just over here, the river's just off the screen. If you go down to here, look across the river, what do you see over there? Basically what you see is a pile of debris. It's got boulders in it. It's got really fine stuff in it. It's glacial till. Down here, there's bedrock. So this is the plug of debris that had dammed the river. Notice it's smoothed off. It's bedrock over here. It's basically been eroded away um, in the failure of that ice dam. And if you basically look at the, how much water that lake could have held in, the lower lake, the smaller of the two, could have held 81 cubic kilometers of water. That's a lot of water. The bigger one held 800 cubic kilometers of water. Um, and basically, when the ice dam broke, all that flowed down out through the gorge of the Tsangpo River. And the question you might want to ask is, well, how many times? How often? How high? How big were they? Well, we're still working on answering those questions. It's kind of hard to answer, because each time it forms and fails, it helps destroy the evidence the last time it formed and failed. But that's what makes field geology kind of fun. You have to put the puzzle together. Um, so we went downstream to India to where you would look for the deposits of those kind of floods to basically ask the question, well, can we find those deposits? And when we did, uh, this is the, the Tsiang River, the, the Tsangpo, in Tibet the river is called the Tsangpo, where it's in the, the Arunachal Pradesh, the state in northeast India that was um, surprised to be incorporated into India. Um, uh, it's called the Tsiang River, and when you get into, uh, out of the Himalaya down into, um, it becomes the Brahmaputra River. So it's all the same river. It just, the name changes at the border. 
What do you see? Basically, it's, it's the river. You see the monsoon trim line. You see this other trim line up here where there's, you don't get big vegetation above it. That's where there was a big flood in 2000 when a landslide dam burst and ran out all the way through the Himalaya down the river. You find our mega flood deposits up here up to 300 feet above the river level. This is a big wall of water. The other thing you notice when you go down this river is most of the villages are a few hundred feet up the valley sides. They know about their place. <laughs> Um, so how do we go about studying this? Well, we, we find the deposits. Uh, this is one set of flood sediments that dates to 1,200 years before present, which, by the way, I forgot to mention, is the date of that lower lake up in Tibet, about 1,200 years ago, radiocarbon. Turns out, when we were up in Tibet, there's a, a story about um, the second historical Buddha, a guy named Padmasambhava, also called the Tantric Buddha, who introduced Buddhism into Tibet, and he came through the valley of the Tsangpo River. One of the miracles he's, he's uh, 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 reported to have uh, pulled off that helped con uh, convert the locals from the animist Bon religion was essentially draining the lake that had been there to reveal the valley bottom that they now form. When did he actually come through this valley? Circa 800, 900 AD. Same time as the carbon dates for these floods of the last time that basically these big floods came down through there. And I wrote about that in The Rocks Don't Lie. It's a con very convenient uh, setup for a geologist who wants to talk about flood stories because uh, basically we found one in Tibet that actually appears to be very much supported by the historical record, the geological record in that area. Um, the last bit of, of science I'll show you is, is just a couple slides on some of the stuff we do on Mars. Now obviously field work is not possible on Mars at this point. Um, <laughs> Although I did have one of my graduate students, we make them put uh, proposals together for things that they won't actually follow through on and do as sort of a, a trial run. He proposed doing field work on Mars, penciled out the price tag. Let's just say it was you know, like $30 billion to send him there. Um, we turned it down. Uh, so basically, what I want to show you, there's this great gash on Mars. It's Valles Marineris, the biggest valley in the solar system. You could park Mount Everest in the bottom of it, and it wouldn't peak over the top of it. It's that big. Um, and the, the ideas of what formed Valles Marineris have been all over the map. Uh, there's like, I could list nine different hypotheses that the Mars community still argues about it. And of course, I have my special preferred hypothesis. As a geomorphologist, what would I do? I'd go to the digital topography of Mars, the Mars Orbital Laser Altimeter data set, or the MOLA data set, and I'd look at the topography. And Valles Marineris is over here. Most geologists have looked at that as a single landform. Why? Well, it's big. You know, the United States stretches from about there to there. It's huge. But as a geomorphologist, I basically stood back and said, well, let's look at it in context. And basically, if you do that and you start going, well, what's this mountain range down through here? What is this deformation over here? This cracks up through here. Um, and you start thinking about the nature of the deformation that is implied by these different landforms. These are compressional landforms down here at the bottom, these, these ridges. Uh, this is a big, uh, you know, extensional crack. This is all extensional. That's all extensional. These little ridges through here basically are orthogonal to directions of flow. You put all those pieces together and what you have is a giant landslide. It makes Oso look small. And this was like real news to the Mars community apparently. Because uh, <laughs> nobody stood back and sort of thought about landforms sort of independent of their size. This is too big to be a landslide. It's the size of North America. And yet, you look at the morphology, and it screams landslide when you look at it through the glasses of a geomorphologist. So basically, uh, that's sort of an introduction to the kind of research I do. I've also gotten into popular book writing uh, over the last decade or so. I wrote King of Fish back in 2003 that looks at the historical um, uh, basically the historical story of what happened to salmon runs in England, New England, and the Northwest. And when I was doing this is where I really first got into the value of historical and archival research. And you know, I just, I just have to shout out to the UW librarians that are here that, that I could not have written this book without your guys' help because it was a, it was a bear to track down all the historical stuff. And almost every secondary reference I found um, you guys might appreciate this more than most audiences. Almost every secondary reference I found, when I went and found the original, there was a mistake in the secondary. <laughs> Almost everyone, including someone who repunctuated Thoreau. <laughs> you don't do that! <laughs> and it was really hard to track down a lot of these things. Um, 
especially the Thoreau one. We had to basically go to the Thoreau Institute and have them look at the original and that kind of crap. But uh, anyway, the um, Dirt was the second one that I wrote. This is one that probably got me the MacArthur. It was also very historical. The Rocks Don't Lie deals with the, 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 uh, the oh-so-non-controversial subject of the relationship between science and religion. Um, <laughs> and it turns out that the story of Noah's Flood is actually a really good vehicle to, 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 to talk about the back and forth and the cross-pollination between science and religion. Because if you go back and you look at the, you know, go into the rare book room and look at everything you can find about geology from before 1800, and I guarantee you at least 90% of it is about Noah's flood. How God did it, how it was set up, what's the evidence. Um, it's, it was the guiding and overarching theory for the first couple hundred years of what you might now, in hindsight, call geology. Um, right now, I'm working on a book, uh, first one I've co-authored, my wife and I are writing it together because she is a biologist and we're looking at, it's called The Hidden Half of Nature, it ought to be out probably next spring. And it's looking at how microbial life essentially runs the world, runs soils in our own bodies. Um, it's um, sort of a view, a different view of nature, um, looking at essentially, you know, the idea that, that there's a hundred trillion uh, commensal or symbiotic life forms within us that actually run our immune system for uh, the most part. It was something that I found absolutely shocking. Um, uh, yeah, the controversies between the pro and antibiotic people that, that, that were basically, um, you know, chimeric symbionts um, are things that is, are, are, are truly mind-bending. And that science is now exploding, I think, in the way that sort of natural history exploration did back in the late 19th century. We're just still discovering who the key actors and players are. And that book is trying to synthesize that. And if I seem a little haggard, it's because I'm on chapter eight right now, and we, I have to have it completed in about a month and a half. Um, oh, and then I also play in a rock band called High Noon. Um, <laughs> but basically, that's the, the stuff I wanted to introduce you to in terms of my own research. I took a little longer than, than I thought I would to do that. But there were some other uh, things that I was seated with in terms of uh, questions about, you know, how are... What's my sort of research process like? And you know, the short answer to that is it's really variable. It's really different for a book than it is for going to Tibet. Um, the common theme, though, is that you know, in terms of the book writing stuff, I need access to an incredibly wide variety of sources pretty fast. Um, why? Well, partly because why fast? Well, partly because my own attention span is sort of short, and I'm not that organized, um, and I need to basically get through stuff and synthesize it. Um, and I've found through practice that if I can't, sort of, if I don't have access to something, I'll probably move on and just look for a different source rather than trying to get it. So the most frustrating thing for me as a book writer is to find out that we don't have access to the journal I really need. <laughs> yeah, that's really frustrating. Um, on the upside is that I've also found that I can actually get just about anything if I'm patient and organized, which are not my strong suits. <laughs> and if I have help, I can get damn near anything. Um, that I've learned as well. Um, is collaborating with other scientists desirable in my discipline? No, it's absolutely mandatory. <laughs> um, you know, as a field-oriented geologist, I never go in the field alone. I never let my students go into the field alone. Uh, I've published, I don't know, I think I've, I think I've published like 250 papers and journals or something. I think probably about a dozen of them are single-authored. Um, the have I found new technologies to collaborate and share information with in recent years? Well, the new technology that I'm obviously really excited about is LIDAR. It's like, it's brand new glasses for people like me. It is revolutionizing surficial geology. And how we acquire and disseminate that kind of information is still very much in flux. And I think there's a huge role for libraries and librarians in terms of being the curators and organizers and distributors of that data. If I left the university tomorrow, the Puget Sound LiDAR Consortium would go black the next day. And I have threatened to leave a couple times. <laughs> um, but that's not the point. The point is, you don't want to have a critical resource like that, sort of balanced on the back of one finicky individual. Um, the, uh, in terms of how uh, uh, data sharing has gotten, um, you know, I've actually found that it is more efficient for me to collaborate with people in Europe than with people on campus. And why is that? Because I can write during the day, I can ship my manuscript off to Europe, and they can write it overnight, and I get it back in the morning, all changed. There's a guy named Oliver Korup, and I, who I've written about three or four papers 
that you can just basically keep it going 24-7 with our information sharing technology. My grad students don't respond that fast. <laughs> um, you know, they have lives. Uh, unlike the faculty. Um, you know, how do I store journal articles and citations? I'm really bad at it. I'm really bad at it. The way that I actually treat sources is I don't gather PDFs and keep them on my computer. I gather PDFs, I print them out, I put them in stacks. <laughs> And then I move the stacks around. And when I'm done with it, I put it in a cabinet somewhere. Um, but I can always find them again that way. I can't find stuff on my computer. Um, I'm not that organized. I could be if I was trained right. But I think that basically the way people use information that way, what we're going to see is generational transitions. And I'm old enough that I'm still going to use stacks. <laughs> why? Well, that's what I started with. That's what I've always done. Um, and why do I print them out? I, I don't like, I know why do I keep them around? I don't like keep printing them over and over again and so forth. I'm also a big fan of actually having hard copies to read. I don't read well and I don't edit well on a screen. My students, particularly the ones just coming in now, are really different. I'm not sure they know, you know, how you know, the, the art of handwriting comments will disappear. You know, not hopefully in my lifetime, but not long thereafter, because I may be one of the last generations that's actually going to, you know, still know how to do that. Um, how do I store data generated from grants? Quite randomly, to be honest. Um, I have uh, uh, data going back in my lab now in I think four different formats, um, none of which I can read or even, I have, you know, I have sort of data from old grants on those um, you know, sort of little square three and a half inch floppy disks. We don't have a computer in the building that will read those things. And I've actually had requests from people for data that I published you know, 20 years ago. Uh, that I've had to basically Xerox a data table that happened to be in my files because I couldn't actually open the disks. That's going to be a huge problem. I think we really haven't wrestled with the sort of how do you make information available and have it outlive the, the storage media. Because the story, what we're certain of is that as technology changes and updates, the storage media we have been using are going to go obsolete. And most people like myself don't have the time or inclination to go back up and change over all the files we had on all our old hard drives as we get to new media. It would be really, really useful and cool to have sort of a centralized data storage where you could kind of know that it will be backed up and it will essentially, and in that sense, data will actually be immortal. Whoever, I forget who said, you know, good data are immortal, but they're only immortal if people can still find them. And I have a whole mess of data nobody, that's never going to see the light of the day unless somebody gets data thief out to my old graphs and reproduces it. Um, is there a desire to share data with others? Uh, that varies greatly from researcher to researcher. Um, I've had some experiences lately of some folks who did not want to share some data on a project that I've been working on and actually talked about here um, because they're concerned about who's going to publish first on it. I've never been that concerned about that and, and after I've essentially published something, I, I sort of feel it's almost an obligation. If somebody wants the data, you should give it to them. Um, and that is, I think, the ethos for most scientists. How we do that, how we make it available, is a big problem. I've had people ask me for large data sets. There's one, actually one now. We published a, a new digital terrain model for the world where we updated. You know, there's some holes in some critical areas like the Tsangpo Gorge that I'm really interested in that we updated and then used uh, and then published a paper, I think it was in Science in February or so. Well, other researchers now want to use that data set and it's huge, and we don't have it well organized. We just sort of did it well enough to do our paper, and now we're getting inundated with requests to actually share it and use it. We don't have the person power or the bandwidth, is probably the right word, in my lab to actually meet those requests. Um, how do new requirements for submitting data to funding agencies affect your work? Well, frankly, and if we could turn the camera off, they don't, because I ignore them. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> um, and, I should, uh, and I should probably open up to questions there, and if the camera's still on, yes, that was facetious. Um, <laughs> I, but I'd be glad to entertain questions. I don't know what your schedule is, but uh, I'd be happy to t take whatever we have time for. Thank you so much. We do have we do have a little bit of time for questions. Um, so we'll take a few questions from the audience. You you mentioned grad students. Uh, what's your impression of grad students now as opposed to ten years ago? Do you think they're prepared, better prepared now or? 
they seem younger. <laughs> um, you know, I'm not really sure how to answer that. Um, I was very blessed with some really good grad students very early in my career. And I still have some really good grad students. Um, the thing that has really annoyed me about the student population is uh, both grad and undergrad in terms of just you know, leaving my own research group out of it because I have a hand in selecting them, um, is just the, the, the poor degree of the development of their writing skills. I mean, that is absolutely across the board my biggest complaint. I used to run a class that had sort of three big reports and I ended up turning into an English professor. I, I mean, literally like topic sentence, important kind of <laughs> feedback. Um, and so that would have to be my sort of biggest complaint. Um, the thing that I think they all could use that we're starting to get them is GIS literacy. Uh, at least in the earth sciences, how we actually handle that is probably as important for their job prospects as English literacy. Um, and I think we aren't doing a very good job on the English literacy, literacy part. Um, my department at least has a program in place where we're trying to deal with the GIS literacy part. Um, the, in terms of sort of like critical thinking skills and, and sort of drive and ambition and stuff, I, I haven't noticed any real change. I was more curious about basic understanding of databases and such. Is there, do you think they're strong upon that? You know, I think it's really all across the, the, the board. Um, I, there are some that I know now that I would have to answer no. <laughs> um, and there's others who are just amazing. Just amazing, and so I, I think that the sort of the, the variance between p individuals that I've seen is stronger than the variance over time. So I'm not sure I've noticed trends in that as much as I've noticed that there's a lot that could be done to bring them all up to the high end. Uh, 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 we're having a session tomorrow about data management, and it's such a topic for all of us talking about. In, we have institutional repositories which people are trying to. to Get traction for, and we hear people talk about mid-level, mid, you know, mid-career, uh, mid-career scientists saying, "Well, I have all this data." And it's, it's very kind of you to call me mid-career, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, whatever. I, I'm not going to get big words right now. No, and I meant that so it's kind. <laughs> well, conversation about lidar data. I mean, we have people are creating geospatial structures, but libraries keep trying to get traction with faculty. Yeah. about getting in that conversation, and it's like lots of things, it's really hard to bridge that gap. So do you have oh, any yeah. suggestions about whether you thought someone in your library community, whether it's not at your university, but have you seen models that you think there could be connections between libraries and like a LIDAR consortium? I th do you have suggestions or comments on that? Uh, yeah, sure, maybe no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, I have no secrets on that. Um, but the, you know, in terms of faculty engagement, the thing that I've noticed over 20 years is that we are frazzled. I mean, I used to have time to respond to requests, but in all our departments, basically what's happened is that the support staff has disappeared, and we're now doing that work, which means that the time, the, 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 the conversation, and I'll get to the other parts in a minute, but the, the I, first thing I just, man. Um, <laughs> the, the part, uh, you know, the, the context it came up in is talking to editors about how hard it is to get people to review papers anymore. Why? Because none of us have time to actually do it. I used to be always, when I started, I had five or six papers I'd be reviewing all the time. You know, it'd be sort of one a week, I'd crank them out. I can't do that anymore. Why? Because there's so many other just sort of small things that have actually grown to consume my time to get the same work done. In other words, the universities have farmed out other staff positions and basically just made the faculty do it. That's been a huge mistake. And I hope that someone in the administration will see this and, and, <laughs> and understand it and think I'm not just whinging, because it's actually a very real effect. And so one of the big problems is trying to get, if you basically come to a faculty and say, hey, how do we deal with LIDAR and set it up? And we're all like, talk to me next year. <laughs> you know, that doesn't help. Um, is there, are there opportunities and needs of doing that? I would say absolutely. The LIDAR consortium gets a ton of use. Um, and the way that it's basically been set up and run in terms of serving it is through the good graces of one staff member in my lab who really likes the idea that we're doing it, he wants to do it. He took it on as basically his project. Um, and he technically doesn't get paid to do it, but I technically cover his salary uh, and I have sources that are general enough that we just say, yeah, that's part of the job. Um, and if he didn't want to do it, we wouldn't be doing it. So. Uh, 
I think there is a real opportunity to, to do stuff. Um, how it should be set up, I'm not really certain. Um, but I think the most effective, you know, if there was a way so that when we got access to data like that, there was a place that we could direct it to, and then basically get it, you know, essentially serve it back to ourselves that way, we could be pipelines for, for data like that. Um, we're not terribly good stewards and curators of data like that. We're actually really bad. I mean, and if you doubt that, look at the Puget Puget Sound Lighter Consortium website and try and use it. <laughs> <laughs> right? We are not the people who ought to be setting up those kind of systems. Um, but I, I think that you know, maybe finding the people who would be those kind of pipelines and trying to figure out ways to actually get what you need from us to set stuff like that up would be the way to do it. But I'm not sure I'd ask us how to do it. Maybe two more questions. So, right. With the uh, cut backs in federal funding for, for, for scientific re research, are you and your colleagues um, able to find uh, re resources from pri private foundations? I know that's sort of a new area for private foundations to fund scientific research. And the second part of my question is, for your grad students, for your fellows, for your new faculty, is there a grant writing education component within, within your departments? Um, uh, for the first question, uh, the short answer is yes. But I've been able to find private foundation money to support private uh, to support uh, public outreach book writing. I've not been able to find a private foundation support for actual research. Um, the good news is that I like the, I like the uh, book writing and my work has been going more in that direction as federal funding declined anyway. It was found, well, I don't need a grant to do that. I'll just write a book. Um, th so my grad student numbers have shrunk dramatically. But part of that is due to the scarcity of funds. But part of it is due to scarcity of my own time. Because the time I put into book writing is not time that I'm putting into graduate mentoring. And it, it, there is 24 hours in the day after all. Um, I'm, I'm personally kind of worried about the degree to which private foundations will be able to make up for the decline in federal, federal funding and how that gets essentially directed. My biggest worry is in agricultural research, oddly enough, um, because there's such close ties between certain elements of the, of, the, of, the, of agribusness and certain practices that then get a lot of funding. And um, you know, it's the direction, the amount of funding available for different research directions actually does influence how much progress happens in those areas. Um, and some really, really important areas are going to be overlooked because there aren't commercial applications. Um, and so that's, that's a big problem, a big issue. Um, but in my own experience, it's the book writing that I've been able to find that actually resonates with private funders because you know, they read. <laughs> um, and if they like stuff, they, they want to see more of it. Um, and sorry, what was the other? Is there a grant writing education oh, right. for your new faculty, um, for your grad students? I don't know of one for new faculty. It would be, it would be very useful. Um, but I also know that some of our most recent faculty in my department write the best grants out of our department. So um, somehow they're figuring it out. Um, the, I make my own grad students when they come in. Basically the goal is that after year one or after year two, we submit a grant together. And basically what I do is work with the students so they are the point person on the grant up until the point where we really have to pull it together and then it's like, okay, I'll jump in. But the, the goal is to walk them through the process as part of that training. And we've just started a, um, there's something that's happened the last couple of years where the, the, there's essentially department level mentorship and walking through how to put grants together. Uh, but, but we're kind of, we've come to that uh, uh, table pretty recently. Thank you. One more question? Yeah. Um, the first one is a kind of related, actually, question. I, I um, was reading a, some research related to, you mentioned handwriting, and then you later mentioned uh, the ability of students to be able to write. There's a correlation between um, the amount of handwriting uh, that is in, 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 in someone's youth and, the, and their grasp on the language and uh, in, in in their own ability to manufacture that said right. Um, uh, that's, that's interesting. I, that doesn't surprise me. It was the first I've heard that, but that makes a lot of sense to me because I know as a writer myself, a first draft for me is always with a pencil. Because why? It slows me down and I have to think about what I'm writing. And I was wondering, 
does gravity of Mars impact the size of that uh, particular uh, slide that we were talking about? Yeah, gravity of Mars is about a third of what it is on Earth, if, I re if I'm recalling uh, right. And the, I don't think it actually affects the size of it for the simple reason that I think something else actually controls the size of it. Um, the, um, it's basically the area, well, there's an area of a certain deposit that extends over that area that got buried by volcanic stuff that I think created a weak zone at depth that it's basically failing on. Um, but the, what I think may be affecting it is, or the way gravity comes in is essentially that it's able to fail on a much lower slope. Because that, that landslide is damn near flat. It's not, but it's, but it's close. You wouldn't appreciate it. It doesn't look like if, uh, the Oso slide, which you look at and go, damn, that's steep. Um, the Mars one's pretty flat. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. We really <laughs> Uh, I just have a few housekeeping announcements, which is a reminder that you should all have a green evaluation form uh, for the two speakers we have today. So please fill that out, and then on your way out of the auditorium, um, Margaret and Margaret will be collecting those from you and giving you a pin in exchange. Mm -hmm. Some of you from boot camp last year may remember you know, pins that you get for the your evaluations. Uh, so what's happening the rest of today? We have free time uh, until dinner, so that's until 5.30, but there is an optional activity, a tree tour of the UW campus led by our very own biology librarian, Kathy Carr. So could I see a quick show of hands, folks interested in going on the tree tours? Okay, great. So uh, if you could just stick around for a minute, and if you want to go on the tree tour, uh, meet Kathy down here at the, at the base auditorium. There's a question. Where's this UW club? A leading question, I couldn't uh, have a better myself. So dinner tonight is at the UW Club, uh, which is on the, there's a campus map in your folder. Um, so you can find it labeled, it's on the other side of the Student Union Building. But if you would like to travel over there in a group, led by one of our own organizers, Mariah is going to be in the lobby of Alders, so that's upstairs on the, uh, the lobby, it's by the coffee shop at the top of the stairs there, at 5.15. So if you meet her there at 5.15, she'll wait for about five minutes, and then at 5.20 you can all caravan over to the UW Club together. So uh, there are cocktails and appetizers from 5.30 to 6.30, and then dinner is from 6.30 to 7.30, and then uh, at 7.30 you will have dessert, and our speaker, Sandy Doty, will talk about uh, earthquakes in the Pacific Northwest. Um, there will be uh, beverages, so everyone will get two drink tickets, so please bring your name tag, because you need your name tag to get your Drink tickets at dinner. Any other questions? No? Excellent. Great. We'll see you uh, later this afternoon. And thanks once again for talking to you.